In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Today our Chaplain's Report comes from the book of Leviticus. And I've been reading through Leviticus for the past few days. And to be perfectly frank with you, and I mentioned this, I think, earlier in a Chaplain's Report that I've just been reading through the entire Bible this year, my church has a program where we're all going to read through the Bible together, which I think is, is really great. Unfortunately, I haven't seen as many people doing that as I'd hoped. I was hoping the whole congregation would do it. It, it seems as though only a handful of us have. But I think it's really cool that the whole church can kind of be on the same page and have having recently read the same scriptures can kind of discuss those. But the thing about doing a, a yearly Bible reading plan is that usually, at least what I've seen in Christians... They're reading through Genesis, and they're fine. Genesis is interesting. I mean, you've got everything from the creation of the world to the flood to uh, the goings-on between Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and then eventually Joseph. And then you get to Exodus 400 years later. Oh, there's all kinds of excitement there. You've got Moses and the Ten Commandments and the parting of the Red Sea and the Ten Plagues. And I mean, it just goes on and on, and it's action-packed up until about halfway through Exodus. And then all of a sudden, it's law. There's nothing wrong with law. And there's quite a few things that we as modern Christians can pick up from the old law reading the Torah. But you have to dig a lot deeper for that. And let's be honest, the narrative's not there anymore. And so the reading, it can still be interesting. It can still be enlightening. But it's not as quick-paced. It's not something that grabs our attention. And then you get to Leviticus, man... There are parts of Leviticus that, again, spiritually enlightening, they're here for a reason, God has them preserved for us, and he has spiritual messages still contained within the law. But let's be honest, it's not exactly a page-turner. And that's where a lot of Christians fall off, and I think they make a mistake there. And I get that it's it's not always super easy to get through some of the uh, the parts of Leviticus, just as a is somebody that considers themselves a Bible scholar. There's parts of it that aren't exactly thrilling to me either that I kind of have to force myself to read. I mean, you get into which stone goes in which position on the ephod, you know, it's not exactly something that is engaging to a modern reader that never saw that stuff or it doesn't have a Jewish heritage, and, and so it's a little harder for us to relate to that part of the Bible. But the thing is, that doesn't stop it from being incredibly spiritually profound. Because, ultimately, God's laws were put in place for a reason. Now, some of those reasons are more obvious than others, and some of them have a direct carryover into the New Testament, while some, frankly, just don't. But there's a great verse that speaks to sort of this theme in Leviticus. And near the tail end of Leviticus, in Leviticus 26, there is a passage there in verse 43, and we'll read 43 through 45, where the book of Leviticus says, For the land will be abandoned by them, talking of course about Israel, and will make up for its Sabbaths while it is made desolate without them. They, meanwhile, will be making amends for their iniquity, because they rejected my ordinances and their soul abhorred my statutes. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them, nor will I so abhor them as to destroy them, breaking my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will remember for them the covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord." So, the truth is, that little three-verse passage there has a wealth of spiritual information in it. 
And to fully grasp what he's talking about there, and I think it's pretty obvious that you can pick up on the context just by reading what God is talking about, is this comes right at the tail end of a lengthy book about all the different rules and regulations and statutes that must be followed by God's people. It was part of the covenant that they originally made, part of the covenant that Moses made with God on Sinai. And the people all agreed to it. It wasn't like Moses just did this on his own. All of the people heard this and agreed to do it. They made a covenant. They made a sacred promise with God that, yes, Lord, we will do what you ask us to do. We will keep your laws. We will follow your law, and it will be our guide. Now, did they hold up to that promise? Not really. But the point is, they did make that covenant originally. And what God said to them was, if you keep your part of the covenant, I will bless you. And he gives them a long list of things that are going to happen, that they'll be prosperous, that they're not going to have to worry about robbers or vagabonds or conquerors of other nations, that they would be safe and secure. He never says they're not going to have any problems or that everything's always going to be perfect, but he does make them a promise that if you do your best, if you try to follow my laws, as long as you do that, then I'm going to be with you. I am going to be your God. You will be able to rely on me and your nation is going to be blessed. You see, the New Testament is very different because God makes that covenant with each and every one of us, and we make it with him through his Son on a very personal level. And it's not that God didn't have a personal relationship with each individual Israelite, but that's not what's being discussed here. What's being discussed here is how Israel behaves as a nation, that if their people keep his laws and keep his commands and do what is right, well, then eventually what's going to happen is God is going to bless them as a nation, as a people. All of the things that a nation would want, prosperity, security, all of those things, God is going to take care of as long as they keep his covenant. But you'll notice that all of this is 100% conditional. And in that verse that we just read, you get the idea of what's going to happen if Israel breaks that covenant. That their land is going to be abandoned. If you don't keep the covenant that I have with you, then the promise that I made to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob, you're not going to be able to take advantage of it. You're not going to be able to use that land to the fullest of its extent, whether you're taken off of it and have to be somewhere else, which, by the way, happened to the children of Israel, unfortunately, kind of frequently. If you're ever taken away from that land for a time or a myriad of other things that could happen to it, whether there's war or famine or plague, whatever it is, God's hand of protection is no longer going to be there to keep those terrible things away from you. And if that covenant isn't secured and your end of the bargain is kept up, then I'm not going to hold my end of the bargain up either. You see, this was all conditional language, and I think that that's something that is sobering for us to think about, that God's blessings are a free gift, but a free gift that does have conditions. A free gift that God does say, in order to keep my blessings, in order to hang on to my blessings... There does need to be some effort from you. You don't have to earn it. You're not working towards it. The work you're doing is not paying off your debt. But there are some basic conditions that I expect you to uphold on your side so that I uphold my blessings on my side. And if you're looking through this, you'll notice something else. That all of these laws... Ultimately, they were supposed to lead Israel to spiritual enlightenment. Because in this very passage, what he's talking about here is making amends for the iniquities, and it says that if you abhor my ordinances, if you abhor my statutes, in other words, if you don't do the things that I ask you to do, then your iniquity is not going to be taken away. And, of course, he, he goes on to predict that all these other terrible things are going to happen to them. But in verse 45, you get a little hint of hope there. Because even after God takes away his hand of protection 
over them, even after they're not able to take advantage of the land that he promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Even after all this, God doesn't forget them. You see, it's kind of like God is a father, which of course he is. Sometimes you got to punish your kids. Sometimes you got to come down on them pretty hard so that they get the message. And sometimes you have to take away things that you want to give them. You want them to have, you want them to be able to experience and enjoy, but you have to take them away because you know ultimately that's going to make them a better person. And maybe that they'll learn something from it so that they can enjoy those rights and privileges a little bit later when, they can, when they've proven that they can handle them. But you never forget your kid. You don't say that, okay, you're not my kid anymore. And God doesn't do that either. Because in verse 45, he says, but I will remember, and he's talking about this even in the context of while Israel's being punished, I will remember them for the covenant with their ancestors. And he looks back at the times where he brought them out of the land of Egypt. You see, just like a parent looks back with their child and says, look, this is a person that I raised, if you're the mother, that I gave birth to, that I helped take his first steps, that used to change his diapers. All of those little milestones, looking all the way back at the child's infancy, you don't throw all that away because you're punishing your kid. And that's not what God does with us. The thing is, God wants us to be with him. He wants us to be saved, and he wants us to be better people. And because of that, occasionally, because he has to, because it's a last resort for him, he does punish us by taking away his protection, by taking away the benefits of that covenant, hoping that we're going to realize that it really is a better thing, it's a better idea to do what Israel didn't always do, and keep his statutes and keep his commandments. And if we do that, then God is going to bless us. But even if we don't, even when we screw up, even when we fall away, and God has to allow us to suffer for a time, the whole time he doesn't forget who he is, and he doesn't forget who we are. And he's still looking at us, remembering all the things that we've done to get to this point and praying that we'll do what Israel, unfortunately, very often didn't. Repent of their sins and come back to him asking for forgiveness. Isn't that what any parent wants when they're allowing their kid to be punished? Isn't that really ultimately all that they desire? Is for them to learn from that experience and become stronger afterward so that they don't repeat those same mistakes? Because that's what God really wants out of us, and that's what he wanted from Israel back then. God is the same God he's always been. He doesn't change. And I'm thankful that he doesn't. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.